Okay, I'm supposed to start talking now. <clears throat> I'm Daniel Shawcross Wilkerson. I'm here to speak to you about uh, distributed transactions for Google App Engine. Um, worked with several really amazing first-rate people on this project, and what I can't stand, and my short list of things I really can't stand about the media, is this myth of uh, the lone scientist, you know, working alone with this, this laboratory, the lone genius coming up with something amazing. Um, most things worth doing get done by a team. I would like the media, anyone watching this, to please start acknowledging that when you write articles. Um, Simon Goldsmith is a very good friend of mine from Berkeley. He now works at Coverity. A very smart guy and very humble. Robert Johnson is a uh, professor at Stony Brook, another friend of mine from Berkeley. He helped us greatly simplify the locking protocol. Uh, Eric Embrist at Google is a really enthusiastic engineer, great guy who uh, found a bug, found an optimization, and also did this little minor thing. He implemented it. Uh, <laughs> that's a joke. Um, <clears throat> Ryan Barrett is right here. Where is Ryan? Ryan, raise your hand because I can't see you. There he is. Brian Barrett is uh, Google uh, at Google on the uh, App Engine team. He's, I believe, in charge of the interface between App Engine and Big Table, and uh, just a very generous uh, guy with his with his time when he knows someone's trying to do something with App Engine. A very humble guy, a very uh, friendly guy, um, and Eric as well. Great guys at Google. Um, let's see. You'll notice my corporate affiliation. It's unemployed. <coughs> In case anyone cares to help remedy that, let me know. Afterward, uh, Tony and I may do a startup, but if that collapses, then I'll be talking to you guys. So um, this is a preliminary report. Uh, what does that mean? We thought we had this thing nailed down months ago, and then we just kept finding ways to improve it. And you know, you can't resist those things. Once you find one, you have to do it. Uh, the only problem is once you improve it, um, you have to prove it correct again. And as we'll see, much of the challenge of this algorithm, it's a very simple looking algorithm. Don't let that fool you. Distributed algorithms and those involving uh, multi-threading and, and distributed together uh, are very, very difficult to debug. They're basically impossible to debug. You have to prove them correct. So this isn't so much the algorithm, but the algorithm plus proof of correctness. So Yesterday I was really checking it to make sure it was really right and didn't have any extra parts and the proof was tight and the algorithm was tight and I'm very convinced now. But we didn't want to release it to you uh, until we you know, all looked at it and made sure that was the case. So we'll be releasing this probably in the next month or so, um, the paper, and Eric has been following along with an implementation as we've been revising the paper and he, we hope to get that out somewhere around the next month or so. Sorry Eric for inventing vaporware and signing you up for something without asking you. Uh, Eric is away at a wedding and Simon's in Europe and Rob's in New York, but Ryan is here and I am here. <coughs> what is the fundamental concern that hits most engineers when they start writing software? Uh, there are many concerns, but two of the fundamental ones that engineers run into is correctness and performance. Um, correctness, is the output what you really wanted? Performance, how much did that cost? There's no getting around this, this is a timeless problem. What I don't like about most talks about distributed computing or um, transactions or databases, anything systems or almost any talk you go to in computer science, they'll start talking about, it wouldn't be cool if we could enforce the isolation of these objects or if we could do these transactions faster. And it's like, why do I need transactions? Why would I want them? Do I want transactions? No, they're annoying. I don't want to deal with transactions. I just want to write my code, right? Um, so when I'm presenting something, you gotta start with what you actually want. So instead of a script going forward, this is more like a make file going backward from the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is I have a program that I would like to run. And it should be correct to do what I want, and it shouldn't cost very much. And I think basically all talks should start this way, but from here we can motivate why you need transactions. And Ryan said, you know, people, are, People of this talk, they're really gonna to wanna to see the details. They're gonna to wanna to know the details of how this thing works. I go to a lot of technical talks, and I'm not an idiot, and I've been to a lot of talks at Berkeley where um, some incredibly detailed thing that I can't follow after two minutes, and then I have to sit there because I can't leave the room because it would be impolite for another 40 minutes, and oh my God, I'm gonna fall asleep. 
<clears throat> I don't want to give a talk like that. So the details of this algorithm, they're subtle. The proof is very subtle. I'm not going to pretend to give it to you during this talk. Uh, I'm going to tell you why you should care. You can read it yourself, or you can trust us. The implementation will be open source. But hopefully what you'll get out of this is why do you care about transactions, why do you need them for distributed computing, and why this is the future, and you absolutely cannot avoid learning about it. There's no more avoiding learning about this. By the way, this talk was originally written to be like about 25 minutes, because I gave it at uh, CodeCon 2009. If you guys have never been to CodeCon, be sure to go next year. It's more like, more like a party, it's an unconference, it's the, kind of the opposite of how managed this is. Um, <clears throat> a lot of good stuff is there, most people don't hear about it. So uh, if I'm giving a talk and I've got it designed for 25 minutes and I have 60 minutes, what I'd really like you guys to do is just raise your hand if you have a question. And I'll probably wait to the end of my sentence or the end of my paragraph, and then I'll probably take your question. If your question is completely off the wall, then I'm going to maybe say, well, let's prune that or talk, to it, talk about it offline. But go ahead and feel free. I, I, I can't stand sitting in a talk not knowing what's going on. So raise your hand. When you do it, you, you all look very small. So raise your hand high like that. You know, Don't do this, because I'm wondering, are you fixing your hair? <clears throat> but feel free, please. Um, it's much more fun to have a conversation. Uh, <clears throat> correctness is our primary concern. And it requires invariance. A lot of people who didn't spend a lot of their time in a computer science or math department don't think about invariance. But if you really want to think about the correctness of your code, uh, especially in domains where it's getting harder and harder to actually debug code, uh, distributed parallel stuff, it's, very, it's just impossible to debug it. Because you may have a bug, and it, it, it's just unreproducible. How are you going to debug it? You're not going to run it in a debugger. Unless you've got some really clever, there are some clever infrastructures people build to try to make them reproducible. But uh, then you got to learn that. <coughs> so the way to think about the correctness of your code is what doesn't change while all this stuff is changing. I've heard someone say the essence of software is change. So you want stuff to happen. But you also want some other stuff to not happen. So computers make it easy to say what you want and have it happen. They also make it really easy to say what you really did not want and have it happen. Um, this is a fundamental problem. So invariants are sentences that are always true. They do not change when all else is changing. Um, I should have put one more thing on this slide. You, you, init you, you decide what should not move. You know, I, my data structures maybe have invariants. I'll give a few examples. You initialize them when you construct your data structures or your objects. You maintain them during operation as you do things. Okay? And the third thing you want to do is you want to pick invariants whereby you can ensure the correctness of your code if you know they're always true. And you'll see what I mean by that when you see the examples. If you aren't thinking in terms of invariants, start now. Software is becoming more and more and more critical to our infrastructure. Bugs are just more and more and more devastating. People die now because of software bugs. Okay, it's not a joke. So you have to start thinking about this. If you get nothing else out of my talk, remember this, invariance and code correctness. Here's an example invariant. You have a doubly linked list. This uh, example is due to Scott McPeak. Um, people think you can't do automated proofs of correctness, but you can now. Um, his PhD thesis at Berkeley was uh, uh, a C compiler that could prove uh, some memory drivers in Linux uh, memory safe, some, sorry, drivers memory safe in Linux. It's the sort, of, sort of thing you should start thinking about. Um, this is really a talk about correctness. So the invariant that uh, he liked to give the demo of uh, was uh, a doubly linked list. You either want x arrow next to be null, or you want x arrow next arrow prefed to equal x. If that is ever not true, you've got a problem. Further, you don't just want it to be true. You want, if it's a multi-threaded program, this is sometimes you have to modify your list, right? You have to add an element in the middle of your list or at the end. Temporarily, this invariant may be violated. What you really want is no other thread can see that. And you want that when you violate the invariant, you don't end up in this violated state, that you get to another good state. Those are isolation and atomicity, which are two properties we want of databases, right? But it's not just about databases anymore. Transactions and correctness, it's not just about databases anymore. It's about all of your software. Many other data structures have similar invariants. Um, you know, you don't turn off your computer without shutting it down because your file system could get corrupted. Boy, that was a good idea. Let's design our software that way. No, let's not do that anymore, okay? Um, it's because they're missing your transaction semantics in the file system. Here's another invariant, conservation of money. You're playing a bank. Um, when you transfer money from Alice to Bob, no money's transferred, right? You're just subtracting and adding. There's an illusion of transferring an object. But why does that illusion persist? 
That illusion persists because there's an invi there are invariants that are maintained. For example, the sum of all money does not change. If money goes away somewhere, it has to show up somewhere else. Local conservation of money is what makes money work. If we could just invent money, <coughs> it wouldn't be money, right? All right, we'll get back to that, invariant, that example. Scalability. We'd really like our software to scale now, and that's why you know, lots of people come to Google App Engine conferences. It's the whole thing Google does is let's do all this cool stuff and make it scalable. Uh, this is a great idea. Um, but you're not going to do it with a big computer. Gee, Google must just have this really big computer, right? That's how they do all that. They just have this huge honking computer. No, they don't. They have a deconstructed semantics. They figure out how to deconstruct what they're doing so they can spread it out over a whole bunch of little computers. There's no way around that. There's no such thing as this mythological, big, powerful computer. Um, unbounded performance scalability. If you'd like people who are enthusiastic about App Engine, it's great. If you write your app the right way, it just scales and scales and scales and scales and it just keeps going. That's awesome, isn't it? And there's only a finite amount of stuff you have to deal with to make your app do that. But there is some stuff you have to deal with. So, the illusion many of us grew up with, you know, I grew up programming Atari 800 in BASIC, and you know, you're programming this computer, it does what you want, but it was single-threaded. Um, it didn't turn itself off at random times. The hardware, I had one piece of hardware, and it never failed, I suppose it could have. But in a big distributed, if your app is scaling across this huge data center, computers that are running your app will be failing. I'm just summoning, <laughs> I'm sure there's Google people here besides Ryan, and they, they can confirm that this is, Google's just losing machines every second, probably. Uh, they're just losing them constantly. Um, things become disconnected. Uh, things go away. So distributed machines have, if we can call them that, or clusters of machines, have the following characteristics, which are very annoying. <coughs> they're not reliable, as I said. They're not serial. M many threads are happening all at once. Um, you really, most people, the way they write data structure code, if there were two threads manipulating it, it would be a mess. We don't want that. And they're non-synchronized. There's no single ringmaster coordinating everything, making it all coordinated. Um, and not only that, there's not even a global notion of time. If you've got a distributed algorithm and it's got a global notion of wall clock time in it in order to ensure its correctness, you're going to have a bug if something's wrong. Uh, this is the future. You might as well learn it. Um, this is what we all have to deal with. But it's a finite problem to deal with, especially if you have, <coughs> uh, well, OK, so Shoot, I thought the next slide was something else. Okay, distributed computing makes maintaining invariance hard. We have to maintain invariance in order to have correctness. We, need, we want performance, unlimited scalability, so we need distributedness. When these two meet, it's difficult. Here's why. Alice sends $10 to Bob. This time it's $10. I don't know why. Okay. Step one, add $10 to Bob's account. Step two, oops, we didn't get to step two. Process times out, machine crashes. $10 is never subtracted from Alice's account. If you're the federal government, this is not a problem, because you can just create money, as we've noticed recently. They can create a lot of money. But most of us are not the federal government. We don't work for the federal government, so we're not allowed to do that. <coughs> How do we solve this problem? Transactions. Transactions are where maintaining invariance correctness meets unlimited scalability. Um, let's call a good state a state where all of your invariants are satisfied. Your program is in a good state. It has all the properties the user wants. Good, leave it that way. Don't change anything. The, the user said they'll like you to compute a service for me. No. <laughs> Don't change anything. That'll preserve correctness. The only problem is it won't give you any performance. So in order to get performance, we have to temporarily violate invariance. You know, we have a data structure it's supposed to point like this. Well, you're going to change one pointer, then you're going to change the next pointer. In between, you violated the invariant. If that state were visible to someone else, that would be bad. So what we want to do is we want to have a set of operations that takes us from one good state, where all our invariants are satisfied, to another good state where all our invariants are satisfied. So um, I'm used to thinking this way, but maybe some people aren't. Um, people talk about the design space or the state space. You can imagine all the variables in your program, all the pointers and everything, is this huge, horrible, high-dimensional space. There are certain islands in that space which are the good points. And what you really want to do, and everything else is horrible, right, badness. And this space is, the good set is very non-convex. It's very non-local. Um, non, non you have to go through badness to get to other goodness, okay? So there's islands of good, good states, and you would like to hop from one island to the other and not fall in the ocean. If you think that way, it's very, 
crazy. So a transaction is a set of operations that get us from one good state to another, if they satisfy all the transaction properties, that is. Um, we first start hearing about transactions in, in school, and they say, acid properties, acid, and they say it over and over and over, and they say it in every class. And you get books on transactions, and they'll say, even Gray's book, famous book on transactions, I actually read a lot of that, and he says the acid properties, and the next page he says them again. Sometimes he says them twice on the same page. It's like, why does he say it one time, you know? And, why? and then I started thinking, you know, why are these four properties enough? Like, are these four properties what we really need? I've never seen this ever written down anywhere, so I wrote it down. Um, actually motivate, why do we need these four properties? <laughs> if you're hopping from island to island, first of all, when you hop to an island, you'd like to actually stay there. That's called durability. It's got to have a big fancy Latin name because we couldn't explain things simply. I, I don't know why. It's academia. So, atomicity. We would like it that you don't fall in the ocean. Okay, that's atomicity. You either hop there or you don't. It's okay if you try to hop to an island and your plane gets canceled and you stay at home. That's okay because you're still on an island. Isolation is that nobody else can observe your in-between state between one island and the next island. These are really the same property. These are like, there is no in-between time semantically between, for yourself, atomicity, or others, isolation. Consistency, drop, I'm sorry, jump, hop from one island to another island. Don't hop to the middle of the ocean. That's really the responsibility of the layer above, and durability is really the responsibility of the layer below. So all we really need to concentrate on when we're using, say, Google App Engine, uh, underneath there's a lot of good infrastructure by people like Ryan and others, um, sure, they're providing durability and a lot of other properties. So you can count on App Engine to keep your data. Once you put it and that put comes back, you know, it's, it's replicated. We heard earlier today in a different talk, it's at least three different places and it's geographically distributed. Good, I think that's good enough. Um, it's up to you as the application developer to hop from good state to good state, to say, run this transaction, take me from this state to another good state. Um, but the in-between layer, the transactional layer, I'm going to talk about the distributed transactional layer I'm going to tell you about. Um, we need to be worried about atomicity and isolation. <coughs> and here acid is, again, again, I don't know why I put that in. All right, so no questions yet so far? Nobody's like, what is he talking about? No? Okay. Um, Local transactions. <coughs> Google App Engine provides local transactions. They provide some transactional semantics. These guys aren't dumb, they're at Google. Um, they said we need, obviously people need transactions. <coughs> but for various underlying implementation reasons that Ryan could tell you a lot about, and I think he actually will in his next talk, um, you need, it really helps them to localize the transactions in space, or what we call space, <coughs> in data. So in other words, when you make an object, in App Engine, you can group it with other objects and make something called an entity group. Once you've done that, that's it. You get to pick the entity group of your object at object construction time. You can't move objects from group to group. There's no such thing. Okay, so these entity groups form a partition of your data. And I think the suggested size in the documentation is, well, that's enough for one user's data. Um, yeah, okay, but maybe my users will like to interact. Is this Web 2.0 thing? Okay, um, <coughs> maybe I'd like to build a bank. You can't build a bank on App Engine right now because you can't put everybody's bank account into one entity group that, that'll overwhelm, I mean, you could technically, but it would, something would break because it would overwhelm the way, they, they've assumed the entity groups have a certain size and it's not that big. It's about the data for one user, like I said, so that's what they say. So <coughs> how do we solve this problem? We would like transactions, but with local transactions, you run a transaction, you'd better only operate on data in one entity group, because if you try to operate on two, you get an exception, I believe, right, Ryan? You get an exception if you try to, yeah. And um, also, uh, if you try to run queries, you can't do that either. Uh, we're not gonna solve, so we're gonna solve the first problem, not the second problem. So those of you who come from the relational world, you, everything's done with a query. You can't look up an object without running a query. In App Engine, if you have the key to an object, you can get it and you can put it without running a query. There's something else called a query. Um, we're not gonna solve the problem called you can't run queries in a transaction on App Engine. That's future work. We are gonna solve the problem called you can't do transactions across a set of objects that span more than one entity group. We're gonna solve that problem. So that you haven't been able to do that uh, until now. Any questions so far? That's the problem and why you should care. Solution. Well, this is the algorithm. That's it. 
It's on one slide. Um, I'll read it to you. The first thing is, what we're gonna do is, we're, we basically want the user, when they run a transaction, they're gonna read some objects, they're gonna read something maybe from the user, and they're gonna write some objects. We want that to look to all other threads as if it happened instantaneously. So the database was in some state, and then when the user, they, they mapped basically reads to writes, and that happened in one instant in time. Now, it doesn't really happen in an instant in time, so we have to provide that illusion. Semantically, it happens in an instant in time, <laughs> but we're separating that from how it actually runs. So what we do is, first of all, when the client says, here's a function, and here's some arguments, run this in a transaction for me, that's the interface. You say, run in transaction, hand it a client function. When the client asks for reads, when they say, read these objects from the database, we read them then, but we record the version number of the object read. Uh, all objects get a version number, <coughs> and they can't roll over, I'll tell you about that later. Then the client function says, hey, write these objects back to the database. We don't do that. That could be bad, that could break something, so we, we're not gonna write any of your data. So we said, instead we store the writes in these shadow objects, and if you try to write a user object, in the client function, we store that what you wrote in a shadow object in the same entity group as the user object. So we spread your data out. It's in many different entity groups. It's cool. It's, it's all gonna work. Now the client function is done. I should have put that in here. <coughs> so the client function is done. The map it computes from reads to writes, that's now a static object of finite size. This is very handy for us. So now what we do is we get write locks on all the objects we're gonna write. Now, if we just do that in any order, what can happen? Because write locks exclude each other, so no two distributed transactions can have a write lock on the same user object at the same time. So what can happen if you just get write locks? Deadlock, somebody said it. Deadlock, because I need this and you need that and we all grab it and we just sort of wait because none of us can get what we need to finish but we're not about to let go of the resources we have so we just stay there and deadlock. All right, so instead, the, you know, the standard algorithm for getting rid of that, sort your objects, get them in increasing order. You can't get a cycle because your wait for graph is only pointing up the order. Then we go and check the version numbers on all the objects you read to see if they still have the same versions they had um, when you read them. Now some of you are saying, but that's a race condition, Dan, they could change after you check. No, it'll work, trust me. Someone should say race condition, come on, you guys are just sitting there. It's much more fun if you say something. Okay, we also check, not only is the version the same, but nobody else has a write lock on that red object. And then we're gonna go do something later. That's not a raise condition. Um, then we go <coughs> and we take all the locked, we take all the shadows and we copy them stomping on the state of the user object. We make your write actually for real. We copy the shadow object to the user object state. We update the version number, which is actually the ID of the distributed transaction object. IDs are guaranteed never to repeat. Haha, -ha. so version numbers can't roll over. And then we delete the write locks and the shadow objects, leaving no garbage. There's a very subtle, very rare condi condition under which we can still get garbage in this algorithm. I'm working on it. If I told you, Ryan would say, Dan, that'll never happen. Well, I don't know what he would say, sorry, Ryan. But um, I'm obsessive about these things. That's what you want. You want someone designing this algorithm to be obsessive. Um, <coughs> All right, there's a lot of things you can do. That's all the de correctness depends on. Um, there's some things you can do so that transactions kind of try not to stomp on each other. Ah, yes, we have a question, thank you. The, right. I'll repeat the question. Um, if I got write locks, why do I then check that the objects don't have write lock? I get write locks on all the objects I write. I get, for the, all the objects I read, which could be a different set of objects, I check the version numbers are still good, so no one else has written it, and no one else has it locked. No one else has the objects I read write locked. Because you could read some objects and write others. You tend to read and then write the same objects, but it could, could be separate sets of objects. Good question, thank you. Yes, and if you were near the mic, please use the mic. Um, this, this is similar to a to base commit. How do you? Prevent it's yeah. There's only so many good ideas in this world. How yeah. do you prevent the client from crashing? 
I'm not going to patent this. Yes? How do you prevent the locks from folks being held indefinitely when the clients crash? How do I prevent the locks from being held indefinitely if someone crashes? Very good question. Okay. <coughs> um, so a lot of the complexity of the algorithm goes into these concerns. This is very simple, but there's lots of things that can go wrong. I'll actually talk about that later, but I'll answer it now. Um, which is, if you grab some write locks and then you just crash, your thread crashes. First of all, all the state of the distributed transaction is stored in the distributed transaction object, which is also in the database. And we don't start rolling it forward until it's in the database. So you grab some locks and then your thread goes away. Someone else tries to lock that object, they block because you have the lock. <coughs> they can check your creation time of the, your, so distributed transaction one gets a, gets a lock on an object. Distributed transaction two tries to get it. Distributed transaction one's thread is timed out or something. Distributed transaction two, since all the state of the distributed transactions is in the database, its thread can pause, go, and become the thread that's rolling forward, this one that has the lock. Roll it forward to completion, then go back and complete itself. So the entire state of the distributed transaction is in the database as well. So different threads can kind of switch off and roll forward different distributed transactions if they're blocking. Um, that's, that's the answer. Make sense? Um, transactions can cooperate. Um, if you are reading an object and, hey, it has a write lock, you probably ought to wait. Um, I'll, that's pretty much it. That probably works. This is all not as easy as it looks, in case you're wondering why did this guy get to talk at Google I.O. I could have done this in a weekend. <coughs> Deadlock prevention, yeah, you've got to do that. But deadlock prevention prevents a lot of other cool stuff. If you've got to sort all the objects you're writing, what that means is the client has to be done writing them. So you have to do it after the client's done writing, and these restrictions begin to accumulate. Ongoing progress, um, there's a lot of things that can cause, there's a lot of ways to deal with ongoing progress. This is, a, it's a big topic. Uh, one is your thread can go away, someone else needs to be able to roll you forward. But what if no one does try to get a write lock on one of your objects, and no one tries to roll you forward? Well, you need a background thread that's looking for old distributed transactions and rolling them forward. Um, <clears throat> also, how do you prevent the user from accumulating unsatisfied distributed transactions? We, we thought a lot about how to, or I thought about how not to, uh, how to, one of the things Gray, Gray talks about in his book on databases, he has this huge book of size of a calculus book on databases, and then he has this one little aside, it's like a page and a half, he says, but the reality can, can become completely decoupled from what's in the database. For example, something that actually happens, some, in a, in a branch office of this like bank, they took all the records and they hid them in the ladies' room, and they never got entered in the database. <laughs> so <laughs> keeping your database synchronized with what the user with the user interface is actually part of our paper. Um, so the, we actually record the user the request of the distributed transaction, so that um, a when you get another request from a user, first thing you can do is query for all the pending distributed transactions they haven't finished and roll those forward first. So the user has an experience of transactions committing in the order in which they requested them. I think that's important. You know, in algorithms class, they've never probably talked about that, but this is reality. Yeah. Um, concurrent roll forward. Um, the second half of the algorithm, where once the, the client function is finished, if other threads can come and start rolling your distributed transaction forward, there could be multiple threads doing that, right? So that means your entire roll forward has to be thread safe. But how do you do that? Because I have to get locks and then release them later. That's not idempotent, right? Idempotent means I do something and then it's done, I never go back. Or I, I, it's like, like a light switch, you switch it on, no matter how many times you switch it on, it's on. It's not a toggle switch. Toggle switches are not idempotent. They're also not thread safe because if I want to turn the lights on, another thread can come and put, hit the button also and then turn them off. And I know I want it on and they come and turn it off again and I want it on. Now, two people turn, turn on a toggle switch, they'll just, they could fight with each other and keep turning the lights off. This is not thread safe, so you need your entire process of getting locks and releasing them to somehow be thread safe. And I'll leave that as a puzzle for the listener. How do you get a lock and then release it in a way that's idempotent? Um, uh, Eric Ambrose came up with a way to do that. It's really clever, it, by accident, actually, in a sense. We I didn't realize he solved that problem. Um, <coughs> proof of isolation, we need to guarantee all these, uh, these properties where no one can see things happening in between um, so deadlock prevention, we talked about that. Get locks in a certain order. Ongoing progress, um, oh yeah, we want read storms. Uh, I think uh, Ryan once said in a talk, is found at Google is 10 to 100 times as many reads per writes in web apps. So this is optimized so that if you have a write 
and lots of people are reading that object, those reads can't keep out your write. Um, some of this I already talked about, rolling forward when you're blocked. Um, we take care not to create garbage, which is actually kind of hard to do. Um, uh, I talked about concurrent roll forward, so we, when we're getting locks, um, we want to proceed, we want the state space of our distributed transaction to proceed monotonically through some big state space where there's only one path, so multiple threads rolling it forward won't matter because they're all going along the same, same path. So they all get to the same place. Um, and this is more about that. Um, <coughs> so this says the answer, but can anybody else figure out how, looking at this and thinking about it, how do you release a lock in an idempotent way? When, when, when we created the need for the lock, we wrote a shadow object. So first you have a shadow object, then you have a shadow object and a lock, then you delete the lock and the shadow object at the same time in a local transaction. So those are three distinct states that actually aren't repeating, even though the lock is getting set and then released. The whole state space is still monotonic. Locally it looks uh, non-idempotent, but it isn't. Uh, strong consistency. Um, eventual consistency is this new fad in distributed uh, algorithms where you don't have to actually make sure everybody else finds out when you update objects, but that's a real pain to program too. Thankfully, <laughs> Ryan is nodding. <laughs> Thankfully, the good people at Google on the App Engine team have provided us with strong consistency, which means <coughs> if I update an object and it returns, then anybody else I talk to subsequently, um, if they look, they're gonna see that update. <laughs> There's something in between called causal consistency where I can tell certain people and they're guaranteed to know. You could actually do our algorithm on top of causal consistency, but they, we have strong consistency, so we don't need it. Um, without strong consistency, it's very, very funky. What does time mean in a distributed, in a distributed algorithm? Local and distributed transactions don't mix. Lo local transactions are obviously cheaper. They have less mechanisms, so uh, Eric has carefully implemented the, uh, this algorithm so that if you only need distributed transactions for certain objects, you can have them only for those objects and not use them for other objects. Um, also, uh, what we don't, you really don't wanna mix them accidentally because local transactions don't honor our distributed transaction locks. So there's no way, with the way Eric has it set up, at least the way he told me, is there's no way to use distributed transactions on an object without entering the distributed transaction infrastructure. You can't use a DT um, if you do, you're obviously suddenly become DT flavored and you are using distributed transactions. So that, we did a lot of work to try to prevent you guys from falling into holes. Like if you use the algorithm just right, everything's fine, then if you do something wrong, too bad for you because you're the stupid user. No, we didn't do that. We really tried to make it so that it's foolproof so that you guys don't fall into holes. Um, also, there's a thing, if we're buffering writes, if I'm an algorithm, I read object X, I get X is one, then I write X is two, then I read object X again, I'm gonna get X is one because it's a buffered write. So we prevent that from happening. We don't allow you to do uh, read after write. We also don't allow you to do write after write. But again, this allows the illusion of correct data flow in your client code so that you're not, we're not messing you up. Even though we're messing with the data flow, you can't see that. So you, you can't mess yourself up by using our infrastructure that way. Also, um, failed DTs throw an exception. Oops, that's not true anymore. Anyway, we leave distributed transactions around after they're completed so you can query them See, distributed transactions are uh, in order, they're synchronous issue and asynchronous complete. You don't know when they'll complete because your thread might time out. So they stay in the database so that other, th uh, uh, your other threads of your application can actually report that to the user. This action you took, user, we can, I, I'm imagining an Ajax UI where in another window you say, you know, this action you took succeeded, this one succeeded, sorry, this one failed, you might want to retry that. But since the database has changed, you might want to check it out before you retry it. Um, that, so you can really have a very professional conversation with the user. These are exactly what succeeded, this is exactly what failed. The user doesn't have to guess. Um, and then the client code can delete, the, the calling client code, can delete the distributed transaction objects when it's sure it has informed the user and the user knows, knows what they need to know. So this is a way to really do crisp apps with very clean semantics where the, there's nothing funny like, Oh, my, I did something and, well, it didn't happen. I wonder why. You know, you can find out. The user can find out. You know. So the whole vision is to write enterprise-ready or apps where you can write a bank and, you know, if you try to transfer money and it doesn't happen, 
you can tell the user precisely that did not happen. For sure it didn't happen. Not, oh, that seems to maybe, it, I guess it doesn't seem to have happened. Um, we don't handle queries. Um, that's because uh, queries are hard. Um, the ability to handle queries depends a lot on the semantics of the query predicate. Also, even local transactions in App Engine do not honor queries. Ryan is nodding his head, but soon maybe some of them, actually, no, okay, sorry. Maybe <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <coughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, no, <laughs> they don't handle. So queries are really tough. Um, and um, one thing you can do, and <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the semantics is, but you can do a query and then take all the objects you got and mark them as red in a distributed transaction, and that will give you something. Um, but I'd have to think exactly what it would give you. <laughs> we need future work on that. Maybe Google will hire me to work on that. I don't know. Uh, <coughs> I have a hiring freeze. He tried to get me hired, but they have a hiring freeze. So. Um, uh, acid correctness example isolation. Ah, yes. Here's an example of why you need acid. Uh, this is from Simon. <coughs> so distributed transaction one gets write locks on two objects and has written object A. It has written the new balance for Alice, but not the new balance for Bob. The other distributed transaction, and then DT1 is paused. I don't know. Gets swapped out or gets scheduled out. DT2 now comes and reads the state of A and B. So it sees that Alice has lost $10, but not that Bob has gained $10 or whichever. DT2 has read a state of the database that does not satisfy the invariant. DT2 must die. It must be doomed. We cannot let it complete. We must abort DT2. And we do guarantee that if this happens, DT2 will abort. And um, the reason it will abort is because when DT2 checks the, when it goes to commit, when DT2 checks the version number for object B, um, it will fail. Well, there will be either a lock on object B or the version number check will fail. Um, uh, oh, yeah, this is, yeah, th there'll be a lock, so it will fail. Anyway, there's various different ways it can fail depending on when things get scheduled, but it will definitely fail. <coughs> Here's that example written out in painful detail. Um, I'm not sure if you really want me to go through this example. Anybody want me to go through it? <laughs> wow. Nope. Okay. <coughs> Future work. We'd like to do queries. It's very dependent on the predicate. Um, we'd we need the, uh, do we really need to rely on underlying strong consistency? Google App Engine provides it, so that's cool, but maybe you could use this on other infrastructures. We don't actually provide strong consistency to some degree. Um, you can't really be, sh you have to do queries to find out when you issue a transaction, you know, when did it complete? So you can kind of do it, um, but you've got to keep asking, did this distributed transaction complete? So you can, you can probably get it if you, if you work. We could, we could add that. Um, performance, I'm not an expert on the deep underlying uh, layers under Google App Engine, but uh, Eric Ambrose at least did one really cool optimization where shadow objects actually aren't manifested as objects, they're just a string which is in the protocol that Google sends over the wire to other machines. So um, there are people at Google, the reason to do this is open source is because, you know, people at Google can help me get it right, A and B, do the cool optimizations underneath, and C, I get to come talk to you guys. So. Um, Conclusion, Ryan said, you have to have a conclusion slide. And what does it say? Uh, distributed transactions on Google App Engine exist. Um, or sometime in the next <laughs> month or two, we'll get them released. Um, <clears throat> and let us know if they help you, or let me know, I guess, um, or write any of us, I suppose. Uh, probably Ryan would want to hear from you as, as well. Yeah, he's nodding his head. That's pretty much it. Um, I'd love to take questions, if you have them. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you guys mind using the mics? They asked me to ask you to use the mics. I can repeat questions if it's if you're in a wheelchair or something. But um, <clears throat> so is this going to be a library that's released so we can use in our application, or is it going to be built in the Google App Engine itself? Eric Ambrist is releasing it as a personal. It releasing his implementation as a personal open source project at Google. So it will be released as part of, uh, I think in fact he's gonna call it Tapioca, uh, or Tapioca ORM, which has an R in it for relational, even though there's nothing relational going on, which drives me nuts, but anyway, I couldn't get Eric to change that. 
Um, yeah, so it'll be a library. Uh, you'll be able to, it'll be, it's for the Java version of App Engine right now. Uh, so he didn't, I asked, will this work for Python too? They said no. Sorry. Um, so um, if you're running, if you're writing uh, App Engine apps in, in Java, you'll be able to use it as a library, as an open source library. Yeah. Uh, please. Hey, Ryan. Uh, so you talked a little bit about roll forward, um, and so most people, um, myself included, uh, have more background with roll back than roll forward. You want to talk about the difference between the two and why this is roll forward? Oh, right. Um, Brian's the one who suggested uh, that this be an optimistic uh, transaction protocol, and I, I don't know if I would have thought of that without his suggestion. In fact, he had to suggest it to me repeatedly because I would kept trying to do it another way. So uh, that was very helpful, so thanks, Ryan. And I think it's because of that that we have roll forward. Um, basically, when the client function is running, if anything goes wrong, abort. Once the client function is done, now the client function has basically created a map where it did some reads and it wrote them to some writes. It's, it's just a, it's a finite diff on your database. And now all we have to do is apply that diff. Um, preserving atomicity and isolation. <clears throat> well, the entire result of what the client did, that whole diff, the change to the database, that <laughs> delta to the database, is written in the database as objects in the database. It's in shadow objects, it's in the distributed transaction object. Um, <clears throat> there's no need, uh, once, okay, so, um, it still might fail because this checks. We have to get locks, we have to check read, uh, read object version numbers, and we have to get locks in the wrote, written and the written objects. If if that if any of that fails, then your transaction is going to abort, and we're going to throw the whole thing away. But once you have locks and you've checked the version numbers, at this point nothing can go wrong. And my way of thinking about what is two phase commit in the first phase, do all the work and get it up so that no, get it set up so that nothing can go wrong. In phase two, throw the switch. That's basically what we do. Once you have all the locks, you've checked all the version numbers, nothing can go wrong. So if you time out, which happens on App Engine all the time, right? App Engine comes and times you out. There's no reason that we have to abort your transaction. In fact, once you've started copying, once you've started copying shadow objects to written objects and you've copied a few of them, you can't go back. <laughs> it's in there. You must roll forward to completion. There's no going back. There's no way for us to undo that. So if you time out, and another thread locks on the same objects, or a background thread says, hey, what's this old DT from yesterday doing lying around? Um, those threads can roll you forward to completion, and there's nothing that can go wrong other than being delayed by more timeouts. Roll back would be, I suppose, if, I don't know, I, I'm not, I, I did learn about databases in order, I'm a, trained as a theory guy and a software guy and maybe a PL guy, but I'm not a database guy or wasn't. Um, I don't know how rollback works, actually. <laughs> so. Um, Whatever it is, we don't do it, because I don't understand it. Yeah, please. <laughs> hey, I have two questions. Uh, please. I don't quite understand what you mean when Can you, you speak a little bit closer to the mic? Oh, excuse me. Yeah, uh, I don't quite understand what you mean when you say that DT is synchronized when it's issued, but not synchronized when, like... When it completes. Who sees what where? I mean, what is... Yeah. I mean, Very good. Thank you. Great question. If I'm the, uh, the client code, I have two parts. I have the caller code, which says, gee, I need to... Update, I need to send $10 from Alice to Bob. Then that code, your code, calls run in distributed transaction, my code, but you hand me a function called transfer, transfer with arguments Alice, Bob, and $10. So then I run your function for you, okay? So that's all synchronous. You called me, I called your function back. That's, in other words, it's normal code. If, I, if function F calls function G, function F pauses, Function G gets a new stack frame, function G returns, function F then resumes. That's all synchronous, that's what you're used to. However, if you tell me to run this, this fu your function in a, in a distributed transaction, what can happen is while that's happening, your code can take so long or there can be so many delays in the database, it can all time out. Google can come and just time you out and then whoop, it's timed out. There's nothing I can do about that, that's just part of the constraints of App Engine. However, that distributed transaction, if it got far enough it's in there, in the database. It just hasn't applied yet. So s some other thread may discover it. In fact, the user will probably hit reload or what the heck, 
and they'll say, what happened? And somehow your user will come and interact with the database again. Your calling code ought to query the database, find any pending distributed transactions by that same user that haven't completed yet, and go, hey, I didn't finish this, and say, and then call us and go, hey, finish rolling that forward. That might time out again. Some background thread might find it and finish rolling it forward. In any case, the completion, you never quite know when it's gonna happen because your code could take 10 hours and every 10 seconds, App Engine's timing you out. So there could be a lot of different threads that have to discover that, roll it forward a bit further. Finally, it completes. It'll complete, complete who knows when, but whenever it completes, your threads may not be around. Somebody else's threads may have tried to lock that, lock one of the same objects and have rolled it forward for you and completed it for you. Now, it's sitting there in the database, completed, and it's sitting there, I'm complete. Then your user comes back to, to your, uh, and, you, and you find it lying around, and you go, ah, this completed asynchronously. It completed some other time. And there's really no way around this. If you write code that takes long enough, there's no way I can prevent, in the presence of timeouts, there's no way I can prevent the need for sometimes asynchronous completes to happen. So it'll, it'll complete. <laughs> If it completes synchronously, if you call my, you say run this, and it completes synchronously, you get the, synchronously, you, you get the distributed transaction object back. And it has the return value, or what, this, is my recommended, this is my recommended idiom that they do in the implementation. It would have the return value. If it failed, it would have why it failed, the exception value. If, um, it would also have the function you called, so you could say, you were trying to do what? Oh, oh, yesterday you were trying to send $10 from Alice and Bob. Oh, let me put that in the UI. That thing you tried to do yesterday, it completed. Let me send that to you, user. So you could complete synchronously, but if you time out, you could complete asynchronously and have to discover that fact later. With a query, it's very, I thought about how to, I mean, I'm not just a theory guy, I thought about how to write the code to do that, and there's a nice way to do it so you can discover things to show them to the user. So you're saying we'll be able to query the distributed transaction itself to ask it, are you complete, or? You can query the distributed transaction infrastructure called, hey, do I have, does this user have any pending distributed transactions lying around that aren't done? Do those first or tell me so that I can tell the user? Or are there some that are done and I should tell the user? You can query it for that. Uh, the second one was, if, if this works as you say it works, what would the point of entity groups be anymore? I mean. Oh, because you might have something you can do with only local transactions, those will be faster. Okay. Our infrastructure costs you. We, man, we really worked on it for months to try to minimize the cost. I mean, Eric puts stuff in there, Rob thought of some optimizations. We really tried to minimize the impact. But if you can do something with only local transactions, just go ahead, because they'll be faster. But I mean, like, potentially you could, you could put entity groups around every single property, what you're currently putting around, like, user spaces, and it'd be the same with distributed transactions, too. You could put entity groups around, in fact, you can, uh, Eric was like, no, I want people to be able to use them both, and if you have an entity group, some objects can be distributed transactions, some local, and I was like, Eric, that's, nobody's gonna need that. And he's like, no, there's this optimization, sometimes you wanna group things for speed, and, and he made it all work. So you can have, evidently, he's told me, you can have an entity group, some objects in there, you, you do transactions with distributed infrastructure, and others you do with local. But if you if try to mix them, it'll, it'll have to go to distributed for all of them. Um, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I did. Cool, we tried to think of everything. We really wanted it to work in reality for you guys. It's been a long time since I'm trying to think of, yes, please. Um, are you saying that the application then has to check if there were um, transactions that completed but weren't, um, um, what is it? They completed the asynchronously. As you issued a request. Yeah. In a distributed transaction, please transfer $10 from Alice to Bob. But for some reason, that has to go recompile Mozilla. Okay, so that takes a long time. It, that, that doesn't return in the timeout window. You got like 10 seconds, is it, Ryan, something? 30 seconds, so they, he, they got generous. Now you got 30 seconds for it to do something, you know? But if it doesn't come back in 30 seconds, then it might still succeed, but later. If it does come back in 30 seconds, you get a synchronous return Right, back. so if it succeeds later, yes. do I still have to have in my code checks to see if there are any pending ones, and then ask for them to be completed? Um, or is it unless a background the thread, or somebody else's thread, or somebody else, or the background thread may have done it for you, but you'll still have to check just that it's, even if it got completed, even if someone else rolls them all forward for you and they're all completed, you still have to check, hey, are there any completed uh, tasks that got done? Oh, well, thank you, let me tell the user. There, there's no way, because how can I otherwise tell you, right? If you, no, I'm thinking if I don't care, right? I, I've got this transaction, it either, it either succeeds or fails, right? It will eventually succeed or fail. Unfortunately, so it can starve. So I don't starve. need to do anything else. If you, wanted to, if you want to absolutely make sure it doesn't starve, 
and you're kind of wondering the background thread might take a while to get around, you can do background stuff in App Engine now. If you run to rely on the background thread to find old distributed transactions and keep pushing on them until they're done, and that thing's pretty aggressive, then yeah, there's nothing you have to do. It will abort or it will succeed. All right. Yeah. One or the other eventually, yeah, please. Probably related to his question was that did you look at stability as a factor it, with these transactions? I mean, the bane in web applications for the most part is in instability of the web applications by complications, so. What do you mean exactly by instability? Like un, uh, not reproducible, like sometimes it takes a long time, sometimes a short time? Like applications going offline because they're clogged up or they're, they're destabilized because of an overly complicated component in the application server. So did you take a look at that and then related to that? Well, hold on, I still don't understand what exactly <laughs> does instability mean? What's the exact phenomenon? Like, you mean, did we look at if we take, if we make things take longer and therefore they're timing out when they didn't used to? Like they're timing out and then the work required to go remediate those, uh, the transactions that are still left running in the system. In other words, is there, a consideration of stability in the application in your design center of looking at this. And related to that is did you look at any other technology that's an alternative to distributed transactions, um, like technology provided by business process execution languages that um, sort of uh, compile like a, a business process into um, a, uh, a, uh, you know, a simpler type of uh, uh, back-end mechanism. All right, um, both these questions are kind of a uh, little amorphous, so I'll do my best. Uh, in terms of instability, what we did is we did the algorithm that has the lowest impact. Oh, I forgot, there's something I didn't put in a slide for. Um, it would have been really easy to have read locks. If you'll notice, our system has no read locks. So if, if your uh, web apps tend to be read heavy, as <coughs> Ryan says, so one thing that Several months ago, I had an algorithm, and I was like, all right, it's done, it's baked, we're way ahead of, we're done. But then I realized I was getting read, I had these read locks, and I was getting read locks on objects which I had read, which means if you read in the distributed transaction layer, that was turning into a write at the underlying local transaction layer. And I realized that's really bad, because writes are always way harder to handle than reads. So we had to turn the whole algorithm around and spend a long time on this just so that reads at the distributed transaction layer turn into reads and no writes on the underlying layer. So if we hadn't done that, this would be a piece of garbage, I think, probably. Um, and you would have a very good point. You'd say, well, you just destabilized my app. And you know what, you'd probably be right. But we've done everything we can to use the minimum uh, resources to make this happen. We have not <laughs> implemented the latest thing, and and, 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 and done, lots of, uh, done lots of performance uh, evaluation on it. We haven't done that. So uh, we, you'll find out when you profile it. Um, could, are there alternatives to transactions? Boy, um, could you not use transactions? Uh, you could try to fold the transactional semantics into the actual logic of your app in such a way that you just happen to manipulate structures in such a way that they're kind of doing transactions and manipulation at once. And, kind of save the cost of our layer, good luck. I would never do that, it's just too hard. Um, I don't know, alternative stream transactions. It's an ongoing area of research, I think, actually. Can anyone, Ryan, you, wanna, you know a lot about this stuff. Do you wanna say anything about that? I think they probably want you to talk into the mic, but. Ryan says it's a talk tomorrow at 10.45 on offline processing and to go see that. And in fact, you should probably stick around for Ryan's talk, which is next. He's gonna tell you a lot about App Engine infrastructure. Uh, yes, ma'am, you, you have a question. Thanks, and Dad. sir, if you wanna get at the mic, I can go ahead and get to the mic. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in Java, you can specify something to run in a transaction and something to not run in a transaction, right? You provide two interfaces. You, you can specify this, do this in a transaction and then don't bother with this other stuff, yes. Uh, can you put a little more highlight about that? Uh, what will be the difference in the states of the objects to not in a run in a transaction and to run in a transaction? Oh boy, um, can you say that again? Did any, I just didn't really hear what you said, so um, maybe you can. Uh, so suppose you specify something to run in a transaction 
and some things to not run in a transaction. Can you give me uh, what will be the difference in the state of the two of, two of them and what will be the difference between them? Oh, how to know what to do in a transaction? Well, you explicitly say, here's a function, run that in a transaction with these arguments. And then here's another one, do that one. So you are explicitly telling the program what to run in a transaction. Now the question is, how do you know what to run in a transaction and what not to run in a transaction? Basically, as I said earlier, you want to figure out how you guarantee the correctness of your application. What things always have to be true, the invariance. Like a data structure, if you have a doubly linked list, pointing like this, okay? Whenever you go to, if you start in a good state, you know, at this point in my code, I'm in a good state. All my invariants are true. At this point, I'm in a good state again. All my invariants are true. But in between, I might have to temporarily violate an invariant. I have to like delete this pointer, point it somewhere else. Uh-oh. Then I have to point that pointer back to there. Ah, now we're good again. That, from a good state to a good state, that should be in a transaction. Yeah, very good question. And you, there's a lot of literature on that. You go look at an undergraduate databases book, they'll probably say a lot about that. Uh, sorry, sir. Sure, let's say I've built my application and I have various types of objects defined and I'm about to, uh, you know, I develop all my uh, code using regular inbuilt Google transactions uh, and then I want to add, uh, but I know that's not reliable because I can't guarantee that things will all commit across these various uh, operations, you know, either all or none. So then I add your framework and your distributed transactions. How much longer will it take for a typical use case where I'm updating a number of records, inserting some, deleting some? You know, what's the overhead of doing these distributed transactions? That's one thing. What's the overhead? Uh, I've then, got less than one minute, unfortunately, unless they want to let me go over. Is there any the, chance to go over well, or not? No, the, she's the shaking other her head. Is how intrusive is it to my code? You know, I've yeah, got yeah. my objects defined. How much more do I need to add? How much? How hard it is it from an engineering viewpoint? I don't want to worry about the details. Um, I'm trying to make it as easy to use as I could. If you need transactions to maintain the correctness of your code, there's no, I don't, you, like you have to use them. So it's sort of a, not using them is a bit of a red herring. It's like you're waiting for a disaster. Um, and uh, in terms of the performance, I've got 20 seconds or so. Um, you know, for every read, we actually do two reads. For every write, we actually do three writes. And um, if you have a read and a write of the same object, you get to save one of those reads. So if you read and write the same object, you have to do three writes and one read. Um, so yeah, we're, there's a constant multiple on how many reads and writes are going on, but it's as small as we could get it. I, I, I'm pretty convinced myself that there is no shorter uh, way to really do it. And now I'm over, okay. I, the, the nice lady in the back is telling me, no, one more, okay. I was just wondering if there's any resource constraints on this distributed transaction table. Like, can you have a limited number open at any given time, or is there a rate of insert limit like there are in other tables? It's going to be how whatever the, I mean, it's a distributed transaction object is just an object like any other object, and it has any limits that Google App Engine has decided to put on the number of objects you can have. Uh, so like any other entity, basically. It's, it's one more entity, yes. And they do go away. So they, they are increasing the amount of resource usage of your app. But when the transaction completes and you and the client code reads and says, "Yep, that's complete, done, delete that thing," it shouldn't be reusing. It shouldn't be using. There shouldn't be any garbage. There's one very rare case where I'm trying to get rid of the. It's extremely rare case where you might get a little bit of garbage. <coughs> All right, I looks like I'm out of time, right, ma'am? Yes, I am. Thank you.